So my talk is about optimal use of aspergenase in adults with ALL. And during my talk, um, I have discussed the, the history of uh, aspergenase, how the activity of aspergenase in cancer was discovered in the 1950s, and the recent approval of multiple aspergenase formulation and the difference between this aspergenase formulation. We have the native E. coli aspergenase that's not in use anymore. And the main aspergenase being used at this time is the degylated aspergenase that has longer half-life, but the problem is the short shelf life. And the more recently approved aspergenase is the Cal aspergenase that has longer, even longer half-life in the range of two weeks. And it has a longer shelf life, which make it an advantage for pharmacy. We have also the RYNAs, that short half-life, and it's used for hypersensitivity cases. The problem with RYNAs is the shortage in production and interruption in supply. And more recently, we have the recombinant RYNA aspergenase that hopefully will overcome this shortage. Um, aspergenase is a key drug in pediatric-inspired regimen in AYA population. And both the inclusion of aspergenase and the more extensive use led to better outcomes in ALL. And therefore, early discontinuation of the drug or develop hypersensitivity can impact the, the treatment regimen and outcomes of ALL. But there have been challenges of delivering aspergenase in adults. Part of it is that ALL is an uncommon disease in adults and aspergenes only use in ALL. So for general oncologists, uh, they don't use the drug routinely. And it has a unique toxicity profile different than other medications, and they're more frequently encountered in adults. And many of these toxicity, although they're biochemical and reversible, manageable, non fatal, they can be perceived as severe, which can lead to a premature discontinuation of the drug. And uh, there are always a question what's the upper age limit for giving aspergenase? And it varies from one study to another, it ranged from 29 up to 65, like what was done in the UK ALL14 study. In that study in particular, they have noticed increased induction mortality. Part of it is sepsis together with hepatotoxicity. And by modifying the, the schedule of aspergenase and omitting the early dose, uh, treating additional patients in the study, that resulted in reduction in induction mortality. And there's always question, what's the optimal dose of pig aspergenase in adults? Well, we know that uh, in children, the, the, the standard dose 25 international unit per meter square. Adults seems they, um, they do better with lower doses. At the same time, these doses can provide adequate aspergenase activity. And these doses ranges from 1,000 international unit to 2,000 international unit. And giving lower doses, can be associated with less toxicity in adults. And another population that experience more toxicity with aspergenes is obese patient. And for these patients, it's more optimal to reduce the doses of pig aspergenes, can range from 1,000 to 2,000 international unit per meter square. And I kind of highlighted the main toxicity of pig aspergenes, including hypersensitivity, which can be allergic reaction or silent hypersensitivity. And the importance when we start giving pre-medication is to follow therapeutic drug monitoring so we can unmask silent hypersensitivity, which can impact the, the results of the treatment regimen. And uh, for patients who develop hypersensitivity, either clinical or silent, um, it's indication to switch from E. coli to Irwina aspergenase. And the second toxicity, which is one of the most common one, is the hepatotoxicity. And high-grade hyperbilirubinemia transmonitis can be observed in a large portion of adults with ALL. And the unique thing about it is that the median onset is two weeks and can take up to four weeks for the toxicity to resolve. This can be seen more frequently with, at older age, an obese patient and higher dose of the drug. But it's not an indication if bad toxicity occurred to discontinue aspergenase. And uh, we should wait on resuming therapy until uh, the toxicity dropped to grade one or less. 
And for prevention, we tend to reduce the dose of pig aspergenase to 1,000 international units per meter square for older patients, more than 40, and for obese patients with PMI 30 or more. Um, another toxicity of aspergenase is pancreatitis, which can be seen in 10%. And it can be severe and can carry risk for short and long-term morbidities. Um, it's more common with increased age, and pancreatitis is a contraindication for continual aspergenase therapy. And we shouldn't switch from E. coli aspergenase to Irwina because it occur with both um, formulation of aspergenase. And when uh, patients re-challenge, the chances of developing another episode of pancreatitis is up to 50%. Um, another toxicity is thrombosis, which can be seen up to 10 to 20% of cases, mainly venous. And it is more common early on in the first cycle, maybe the consolidation, then the incidence drop. And it is observed more frequently in older age obesity. And very importantly, when the physician starts replacing hypofibrogenemia with cryoprecipitate. Now, importantly for thrombosis, you can resume aspergenase if the patient remains on anticoagulation, and the chances they will develop another thrombosis is very low. Typically, we continue aspergenase unless the thrombosis is severe, like cavernous sinus thrombosis. Um, there are other toxicity can be seen with aspergenase, including hypertriglycidemia, which is usually self-limiting and not correlated with pancreatitis. Usually it doesn't need treatment, but you can provide genfibrosis for the patient if the toxicity is high. You can see hypofibrogenemia, but the bleeding risk is low. And very important to avoid cryoprecipitate replacement for the lab uh, results unless patient is actively bleeding. And we discussed also the risk of hyper ammonemia and uh, metabolic encephalopathy with aspergenase. There's increased risk of hyperglycemia and also necrosis. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.